we are going to be in the book of Jude today, and we will get there by the book of Revelation. I'm in the process of losing my voice. I hope that it holds out for a little bit longer. Somebody has blessed me with a, with a cold with this. We are in the book of Jude. Great little epistle. Power-packed epistle. Let me put this down. But we're going to get there, like I said, through the book of Revelation. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can approach this. I would not start here with what it is that we are going to do. And just for the record, might as well say it one more time. If we were going to do the book of Jude and have 15 sessions, we would do the book of Jude entirely different. But we have basically a session and a half on the book of Jude. Let me go ahead and move the ink pen out of the way. Y'all are thinking some kind of hermeneutical significance is to that. There is not. So let me move this over. I would not do what we are going to do now unless we had already done the previous session on the introduction to false teachers. And so that being said, with the introduction of false teachers, we can add other stuff to this and we'll actually get to the book of Jude today. And also for those who are in here who have had Greek already, um, I'm just going to stay for the most part with the present active indicative whenever I use a word other than there's a case where we need to point out that it is a perfect tense or something like this. And so sometimes when you are studying, it is very relevant to see what's in there, how many times it is, where it is elsewhere. And so for instance, for those who've had Greek, let me go ahead and write this out and get it out of the way. Tereo. Now for those who have not, let me go ahead and do this. Tereo means, using the infinitive, to keep, to guard, to heed. And so this is used a lot of times, and we're going to see it today. It is used of a divine work at times, and it's also used of those who are obedient and those who are disobedient. And so perhaps if we work our way through to the book of Revelation, you will see this. In fact, this occurs 70 times, this word does, 70 times in the New Testament. We're not going to go through every one of these, but we are going to walk through aspects or different ways in doing with this. Revelation chapter 1, just to give a for instance, and you'll see how this ties in in the book of Jude in just a little bit. In Revelation chapter 1, look at what it says. It occurs 11 times. We're just going to walk through briefly to get there. 11 different times. Notice what we said. There's going to be an aspect where God has a part. There's going to be an aspect where people or, in some cases, angels have a part as well. And so look at what it says. Revelation chapter 1, first three verses. First use of Tereo. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must shortly take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel or messenger to his bondservant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he said. Now, here's the first use of Tereo. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads. And those who hear the words of the prophecy, and at least the New American Standard edition that I have, has, and heeds or keeps the things which are written in it for the time is near. And so in this case, Tereho has a sense of keeping, of heeding, not just hearing the word. And James would be a meaning wholeheartedly. Not just a hearer of the word, but a keeper, a doer, one who heeds the word. It says, second reference, chapter 2, verse 26, look at what it says. It's part of the overcomer promises. And he who overcomes, look at this, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nation. And so the same thing with us. Just because somebody claims, and of all the churches, this is the church at Thyatira, this is the church that has that woman Jezebel who deems herself to be a prophetess. For those who the church at Thyatira and the overcomers, 
for, <coughs> excuse me, for those who keep the word. There's a sense of not just hearing it. There's a sense of not just knowing it. There's a sense of also keeping, heeding, implementing the word. Look at the third reference, chapter 3, verse 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. And look at the injunction, the imperative from Jesus. And keep it and repent, Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. And so throughout, it is not just a matter of knowing the word. It is a matter of keeping the word. And so this is more the responsibility of the people. Look at chapter 3, verses 8 and verse 10. In fact, this is very important for those who will be alive whenever this takes place, and it may be our generation. Here's what the Lord says in chapter 3, verse 8. This is a church at Philadelphia. This is a church that he approves of. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and have kept, tereo, have kept my word, and not denied my name. Now, for a study on false teachers, this is going to be very, very pertinent, very important. False teachers will claim to be following God. Just because somebody claims to do so in and of itself does not make it so. And so for this, Jesus says, in fact, would be true for us as well. Behold, I've set before you an open door, chapter 3, verse 8 again, which no one can shut. Because you have a little power, Jesus holds this very important, does he not? I've placed before you an open door. You have a little power and have kept my word. It doesn't say that you are academically brilliant. It does not say that you are multitask, gifted individual, that people will flock at your feet. What it says in regard to faithfulness is that in this particular verse, you have kept my word. By the way, chapter 3, verse 10, twice tereo is used in this case. Because you have kept, Tereo, the word of my perseverance, I also, Tereo, will keep you from the hour of testing that's about to come in the whole world. It is that important to Jesus. There's a sense of anybody who calls themselves a Christian, we're going to see this later on, anyone who calls themselves a Christian and yet does not keep the word of God is deceiving himself. In some cases, deceiving others. The closer we get to the Lord's return, they will not endure sound doctrine. The closer we get to the Lord's return, they will accumulate teachers in accordance with their own lust. And all of this will be done not as a false religion or a different religion, but will be presented as what the gospel truth is. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. A few more times in the book of Revelation before we go to the book of Jude. Chapter 12, verse 17. Look what it says with this during the tribulation period. That Chapter 12, verse 17. The dragon was enraged with a woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. And here's the offspring even in the tribulation, even when the Antichrist reigns. The offspring who keep tereo, the commandments of God, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That is a wonderful encouragement of what is going to take place during the tribulation. And yet we're going, when you study that, we don't have time to camp out there. But when you study that, you're going to find out that it will cost them their life in all likelihood. Some will be saved through it. Most will die. Chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who tereo keep the commandments of God. And tereo is carried over with that their faith in Jesus. Anybody who wants to study the perseverance of the saints, this is a wonderful verse to do. Does it not mean that you're not going to have bad days as a Christian? Does not mean there will not be times of stumbling somewhat along at times. But the truth of the matter is the perseverance of the saints, you are going to keep the word. You are going to keep the faith all the way until the end. A few more references and over to the book of Jude, chapter 16, verse 15. This, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments. Keeps, by the way, his garments, tereo, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. 
an aspect of obedience, an aspect of implementing the faith in practice. A couple of times at the end in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 7. Now, in a book of 22 chapters, it's actually a lot that this shows up 11 times in the book of Revelation. The next to the last one, chapter 22, verse 7, and behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds Tereo, who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I don't know about you, but I want to be a blessed individual by Jesus' definition. And so if you're going to be a blessed individual, it starts off in the book of Revelation. Blessed is the one who hears and heeds or keeps the words of this prophet. And in the same way, blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Well, what if you have the majority of those who call themselves Christians not walking with God? What if you have the majority of Christians going after every wind of false doctrine that's out there? It doesn't matter, does it? If you were the only Christian on the face of the earth, God is God, Jesus is Jesus, his word is true. And so it is not based off the numbers of people who do what? Because after all, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many shall find it. Narrow is the way that leads to salvation and few there are who find it. Blessed is the one who heeds, believes, takes to heart the words of this prophecy. I don't know about you, I want to be in a blessed capacity before the Lord. By the way, the angel, after John tries to worship him, the last time Tereo is used in Revelation chapter 22, verse 9, after John falls down to worship the angel, the angel says, stop, 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 stop. Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets. Look at this. And those who heed, those who keep the words of this prophecy. It is that important to Jesus. It is that important to angels. And so that being said, if you've got this occurring 11 times in the book of Revelation, that is a pretty significant number of times that Tereo is used. If you want to do, even though chapter divisions are man-made inventions, it would be one out of every two chapters in the book of Revelation, average-wise, has some form of tereo that's used. Now, that being said, when we come to the book of Jude, you have very important uses of this form tereo. And again, it's such a, um, it has such a wide spectrum of people in here who has had what? Some of you are into your second and third year of Greek, and you can go a whole lot deeper than some of the others. Some of you are waiting, and we'll take the crazy Greek this summer. They're what they used to call it, gladiator Greek, I think is what it's called now. They used to call it crazy Greek, because everybody went crazy who took it during the summer, and they tried to come up with a better name. Gladiator sounds more masculine. And so with this, we have a classroom. We have people in here who have had Greek. We have people who have not. And so I'm just going to put stuff down. And you can take it and develop it as much as you want to as you are able to follow along. You've got 25 verses in the book of Jude. You have five times that tereo is used. And so if the book of Revelation has 11 uses in 11 chapters, how about the book of Jude having five uses in 25 verses? And so one out of five verses is going to have some reference to tereo, and these are theological gold mines. Now, again, the reason I say that, I wouldn't start this. I wouldn't start our study today here. I wouldn't start with tereo. I'd start with the false teachers, false prophets, all the background stuff. But it is interesting because the tereo aspect, you're going to see God's work. You're also going to see aspects where people did not keep what God has said. And so in the book of Jude, just a brief review and walk through, you remember from your previous studies, or hopefully as your projects will indicate, that Jude is the brother of James, the half-brother of Jesus. He writes wanting about to do about the common faith, and yet there are false teachers who have snuck in. And so he has to write a letter that is protective. He has to write a letter that will sustain them in the faith somewhat. I don't know what you have done in your background studies with this. It's interesting, the book of Jude, when you go through here, 
you will find a lot of times you'll put triplets in there. These little phrases and threes, we'll see these as we go. You may remember from previous classes that he uses six Old Testament examples, historical examples, and he also uses 12 characteristics of the false teachers. And so it's a very symmetrical book. But let's do the first use of Tereo in the book of James, because this is significant. The first use of this. In Jude, verse 1, look at what it says. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and look at this, and kept tereo for Jesus. It's interesting on this kept for Jesus. Let me go ahead and write. I can't do English and Greek at the same time. I'll end up writing half and half. You probably will do the same thing whenever you do this. It's a participle, but it is a perfect participle, a perfect, whoops, a perfect passive participle, having been kept. In fact, the perfect has the tense of the action is completed and the effects go on quote, in the Greek mind forever, hence the perfect tense. But what a wonderful opening statement in the book of Jude. It is a biblical impossibility for you to lose your salvation because you are kept perfect tense. If you are saved, now again, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of God. But the perfect tense, the completed action, the action is completed, the effects go on. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are perfect passive participle tereo form. You are kept for Jesus Christ. And obviously the one who does the keeping is, in essence, God the Father, although the Trinity obviously will play a factor into this. And so just to begin with, for those who are in Christ Jesus, what wonderful assurances we have out of God's word. When you have people come to your door and tell you there is a different gospel, no, it's once and for all been delivered to the saints. And not only that, if you really are saved, you are kept. Somebody has to be stronger than the keeper to undo this. And you're not going to find anybody in heaven or earth or under the earth, including yourself, who has the power to take you out of the hand of Jesus. And so just this particular one is a work of God, not a work of us. This is a work of God. The action is completed. Having been kept for Jesus Christ. And that's going to be on your worst day as a Christian, you're still kept Jesus Christ. It is a blessed, blessed verse to go through. We'll work our way through and then come back up here and go through this. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Verses 3 and 4 as we work our way down. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. I don't know if you mark your Bible. You really need to mark the once and for all delivered to the saints. If it is once and for all delivered to the saints then there is no additional revelation given in Elmira, New York, where you have gold and spectacles and the Book of Mormon to go through, or Jehovah's Witnesses' uh, edition of their Bible or anything along those lines. I have never talked to anybody in a cult who could give a good response to verse 3 of Jude. It is delivered once and for all. You don't have to worry. Whether it is the Gnostics of the first century or anything else coming down the pike, it is once and for all delivered to the saints. It hasn't changed any. You're not missing anything. You're not lacking if you were in Christ Jesus. And so it has once and for all been delivered to the saints. For those who are in hermeneutics class with me uh, last year or this year, and those who were in chapel for this morning, what is truth? Has God said? God has not said as we work our way back through the, the different things. Same thing here. 
Has God said, yes, he has, once and for all, it's been delivered to the saints. How good a job has what has been delivered to the saints accomplished? It has kept you through eternity in Christ Jesus for God. Back to the first verse. And so when the false teachers come along, what happens is a lot of times people are not established in sound doctrine. And then when the people come up, it sounds good. It sounds like a, a winning proposition. And actually most times it is entirely different than what the Bible says. For certain persons, verse 4, have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our Lord, uh, grace of our God rather, into licentiousness, that is any kind of uh, lifestyle that you want to live, any kind of sin that you want to do, and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And here we go, we're working our way down. I'm going to pick up another tereo. I desire to remind you, though you know all things, once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Look at verse 6. In Jude 6, you have two different references. You have the second reference and the third reference to Tereo. And so in verse 6, in angels, uh, let me see how to do this. Angels, who did not keep, who did not keep, look at the contrast. These are connected. Still in verse 6, angels who did not keep their own abode, the domain, but abandoned their proper abode, God has kept. He has kept. Angels did not keep. He has kept. In fact, it's interesting on this. This is another perfect participle. He has kept them, and he still keeps them. And so the angels who did not keep, tereo, did not keep their first estate. I trust you have worked through that in your study questions. Those who did not keep their first estate, since they did not, God did. And by the way, the same God who holds you, holds them. The same God who holds you sovereignly in a loving way in verse 1 holds them sovereignly in an unloving way in verse 6. And there is nothing in, not so much the world, there's nothing in creation that allows them to remove themselves from what God has determined that they should do and what God has determined where they should be. Now, when you work through your way in the book of Jude, either in your own study or in your own preaching through this, it's interesting when you go through this. You know what happens, even whether it's angels, or let's just go through it, and we'll back up. Look at verse 5, and working our way through this. I desire to remind you, though you know all things, once and for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Talking about the wilderness generation for those who perish there, and they perish there because of their unbelief. All right, so you've got the wilderness generation. You've got angels who did not keep their own domain. Look at verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Every one of these have common characteristics. Every one of these sinned against light. Every one of these had the command of God and turned away from it. A common characteristic that every one of these had was that they did not believe that they would be held accountable by God. They thought they could do what they wanted to do and not have any kind of consequence for that. Now you go back what Jude says about the false teachers that they turn the grace of God into licentiousness. Licentiousness basically means all the borders, all the boundaries are off. There are a lot of churches that their primary doctrine is that God would never, ever, ever want you to be unhappy. That if you've got a particular lifestyle that you want to live, then just go out and live it. There really is no such thing as sin. Just go ahead and 
It doesn't matter whether you are married or whether you are not. Just go ahead. Now, again, don't quote me on this. I'm telling you what false teachers say. Don't come out of this and say, you know what he said in class today? Now, that would not be accurately representing this. And so every one of these, the wilderness generation, they had revelation from God. They did not really believe the revelation from God. God held them accountable. How about angels? Did they have revelation? Boy, they had more than we have. They have knowledge. And still they sinned. God held them accountable. Sodom and Gomorrah, same way, did not heed the words. And so the false teachers will promise freedom. The false teachers will say it doesn't matter. The false teachers will say anything goes. Lifestyle-wise, there's no such thing. False teachers, again, will justify the lust of the flesh in the name of God. And they will have a high, high calling with it. Now let's do this. Working our way through, did you get down to verse 9 in your studies? But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil about the body of Moses, we would have no idea that was in there unless it's in there. Just for the record, now that it's in there, I mean, it's one thing to know what it says. It's an entirely different thing to know what it means I will be real interested as I go through your study questions to see what some of you came up with. The idea you could probably run across this. Let me go ahead and tell you what I know about this. I don't know. I don't know why it's there. I have no qualms in saying so. But it is interesting that it meant that much to not only Satan to take Moses' body, it meant that much to God to put it in his word. For whatever it's worth, I would not be a bit surprised if Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses of Revelation. I may be completely off base with this, not saying that it is. If it is, then this ties in with that. And if it's not, then we don't know other than God wanted us to know it. Know that he is certainly stronger and smarter than Satan in any kind of efforts that Satan has to thwart the plan of God. But put down a stake. You are looking at gold. Now here comes the characteristics. Working our way, verses 10 and following, these men revile the things which they do not understand. And the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they were destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And for pay, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Every one of this on this triplet, everyone had the word of God, had the consequences laid out before them, and still chose to go against what God said would take place, not believing that God was fully able to bring about the judgment that he had promised. And so here comes the description of the individual, starting in verse 12. These men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feast. Now remember the whole thing about this. It's deception. The whole thing is about creeping in. The whole thing is about disguising themselves. A hidden reef does not matter to you if you are sitting on the land. But if you're out in a boat and you've got a reef that's out there that's just a little bit underwater, can do tremendous damage to the boat. Right now, it probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you. If you're out in the Aegean Sea, it means a great, great deal to you. And so if they're hidden reefs, then they are sneaky, but they're still dangerous. In fact, even more so. And in your love feast, when they come with you there without fear. And I notice that these, again, are those inside the body of Christ. These are those who would call themselves Christians. These are those who would call their doctrine Christian doctrine, orthodox doctrine, biblical teaching. And so they are inside a church setting. This particular case does not talk about false religions. Clouds without water. How fitting it would be to be in the Middle East, especially in the land of Israel, and be wanting the rain to come and to have the cloud come and offer no benefit whatsoever. And so part of the description of them is that they are clouds without water, carried along by the winds, real similar in Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul talks about that unless you are built up, you're carried away by every wind of doctrine. Autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. When I was doing my uh, THM thesis on false teachers, I, I talked to a number of different people, and they had somebody in mind, a particular one, 
a national one, uh, most of whom have passed from the scene since I've worked on this. But there was this mentality that, yeah, I know this guy's probably a false teacher. I know the doctrine does not line up biblically, but he does so much good. He does so many things to help people. There's an orphanage in some particular country. Look at all the good thing he does. Well, according to God's word, they are doubly dead. They are uprooted. They do not do any good whatsoever. Now, if our righteousness is but filthy rags in and of themselves, how much more somebody who leads people into false doctrine, leads them away from any kind of truth whatsoever. In fact, they are doubly dead, uprooted, Verse 13, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame from foam. And look at this, wandering stars. Now, God made the heavens and the earth, including the planets. I'm an English lit major, and some of you have science backgrounds that vastly exceed mine. Um, I have always enjoyed studying the stars. Not talking about astrology, talking about studying the stars is how God does them. The early um, observers of the, of the stars had problems when they did this because you understand that stars will go in a pretty much the same path. I understand different parts of the season, Orion will appear, different parts of the sky. For those who know about the North Star, the North Star will always be in the north. That's why they call it that. But yet they had, as they looked out at the night, they had what they thought were stars. And actually, this particular star sometimes was brighter, and sometimes it was by the moon, and sometimes it was over here. You know what these are called? This is from the Greek word planao, and we get our word planets from these. Planets were wandering stars from the eyes of the observer. And so here is all the other stars doing on their course. And they'd go through the year and they would be at their, in the constellations where they're supposed to be with pinpoint precision as God had made. And yet from a visual standpoint, there were other stars, planetos, kind of combined the English and the Greek. The planets were wandering stars. The planets were stars who went off the designated course, again, from the eye of the, the observer. It was not until the... They later learned that these are not stars, but these are planets. And so planetos, planetos, planets are wandering stars. What a perfect description that is for false teachers. Because you have the word of God that is given once and for all, delivered to the saints. And so you should not be over here, should not be up this part of the sky, should not be all over the place. It's just one of their descriptions. And it's a very a fitting one with this. By the way, our fourth case of Tereo, to get back to this. And so look what happens. Verse 13. Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been Tereo kept reserved forever. And so the black darkness... has been kept, has been reserved, another perfect tense, has been kept forever. By the way, this is what, verse 13? Has been kept forever? Bottom line is that God's in control. Bottom line is God is going to bring judgment. He did on Sodom and Gomorrah. He did on Cain. He did on Balaam. And he will with these false teachers as well. When you do this, if you're not careful, you can go nuts with all the junk that's out there. You can get very discouraged as a Christian. Bottom line is that God tolerates this for the time being. And so just as the demons are held in judgment, these are also the black darkness has been reserved. It is already set up. And so here's what's, what takes place. Drop down, if you will, for time's sake. Let's get our last Tereo because we need to move over and then we're going to come back. Because look at what he says with this. These four, the first four uses of Tereos are all statements. 
or all in the, in essence, just declaring something that took place. The fifth use of tereo that we have. The fifth use is an imperative. The fifth use is a command. I mean, you are not commanded to keep yourself to be kept for Jesus because God is doing that. The fifth use is a command. Look at what it says. Verses 20 and 21, and we'll come back to this in just a minute. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and here comes the aorist active imperative, keep yourselves. Tereo, verse 21, keep yourselves. Keep yourselves in the love of Christ. This is true doctrinally. This is true lifestyle. We'll see this in just a moment. Keep yourselves in the love of Christ. And so before, there have been statements of what has taken place. God has kept us for Christ Jesus. The angels who did not keep, God has kept. The black darkness has been kept, has been reserved forever. And so we have the responsibility. Keep yourself in the love of Christ. It is one thing to say it. It's another thing to how do you do this. It's one thing to say keep yourself in the love of Christ. It's another thing. Is there any kind of information? It's appropriate that we do this. If you will, just real, real briefly, over to 1 John. Right, hang left in June. Go over to 1 John. We'll be in chapter 2. I think 1 John gives us a very good description of what keeping yourself in the love of Jesus requires. John writes to groups who are affected by what will become Gnosticism. Basically, the Gnostics said you had one of two different ways. In fact, <laughs> well, there are a lot of different offshoots of this. But Gnostics taught basically the spiritual was important, the physical was not. I worship God with my spirit. My body's going to do whatever it wants to do. And so technically speaking, according to them, and again, don't misquote me on this. Don't say, you know what he said in class today? Here's what the Gnostics would say. I mean, after all, when you die, your body is pretty much what's left. When you die right now, does your body go to heaven? Your spirit go to heaven? Spirit? All right, your body does what? Goes to the grave and decays. Your body's going to do what it wants to do. Worship God with the spirit. So in other words, they would redefine sin. They would say there's no such thing as sexual immorality because after all, my spirit didn't do it. My body did it. My body's temporal anyway. The spirit's eternal. The body's going to go to the grave. Um, the spirit's going to go to God. And it was very much false teaching that influenced massive amount of the church during this time. There's also, for the record, there's also a set of Gnosticism where you would do the severe treatment of your body. I think most people would gravitate towards the first one, although the second one was uh, quite effective as well. And so all about First John writes, and we're, we're leaving out just oodles, all that John writes in First John, there is the false teaching background. The Gnostics were the wise one. The Gnostics were the one that says this is the way to God through knowledge. And that if you had the secret knowledge that I had, sound familiar? If you had the secret knowledge that I have, then you would have an access to God that you do not have. And so that's why John writes about the common fellowship in Christ. But he uses tereo in a way that gives us a very good example of those who keep themselves in the love of Christ and those who do not. Seven times in this short epistle, tereo is used. In fact, there are three right in a row. Beginning in chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and 5. So in other words, if you're going to preach this in a church setting, you would need to make sure that when you come down to the section about keep yourselves in the love of Christ, you do it by his definition, not by ours. Just to go through this real briefly, 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him, verse 3, if we tereo keep his commandments. And so for the Gnostics who would come along and say, we know him, but we don't keep his commandments or the false teachers today for the same thing. 
I look at this. The second use is in verse 4 of the same chapter. In fact, let's just go back, verse 3, just to get the flow of this. By this we know that we have come to know him if we tereo keep his commandments. Verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not tereo keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Beloved, this is not legalism. This is just biblical truth. The number of people who call themselves a Christian and yet have nothing to do. Their lifestyle has not changed. They have not repented of their sin. Not only have they not repented of their sin, they don't even consider what they do to be sinful activity. Then the truth of the matter is, according to the word of God, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Verse 5. Third use of tereo. But whoever keeps, present tense, tereo, his word, in him the love of God truly has been perfected. And now this is the same book that says, I write to you so that you, sh that you should not sin, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. That's true, isn't it? And if it comes down to this, you might as well lay it out on the table. If ever anybody says, well, you don't deserve it, that is exactly right. And that is exactly what we cling to. We absolutely do not deserve salvation. And so, but that being said, we absolutely take our salvation very, very seriously. You get to the point as you, you walk with the Lord, you do not do it in the sense just out of fear. You do it out of love. You do it in regard for him. And so for this, you have tons of people. There was, I have read uh, a newspaper interview with a lesbian minister. Gives you a real good idea. That's not the ultimate sin per se, but it just gives you a real, real good idea where they are in regard to the reference, in regard, in regard to the Bible. And so with this, he was saying, this is my special gift from God, and the ministry that I have is my special ministry given me by God. You know what God's Word says? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Tereo. Anyone who keeps, not suggestions, keep my commandments. The one who claims to be a Christian and does not keep the commandments of God. Again, this is not legalism. Some people can take it and run with it and make it into legalism. Here's what the Word of God says. Four more uses of tereo in the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, verses 22 and 24. Verse 21, might as well start there. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we, Tereo, keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Verse 24, and the one who, Tereo, keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. A couple more references to Tereo, and off we will go to the book of Jude. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For those who mark your Bibles, here's a real good summary statement of those who do and those who do not. Verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we, Tereo, keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And so again, if you love the Lord, you're going to keep his commandments. Now I realize that I'm preaching to the choir when I do this at the Master's Seminary, and that should be an aspect of your life for you to be here. That being said, there's so much junk out there in the world. There's so much junk and false doctrine that people have access to through internet or TV shows or bookstores that actually understand. I'll tell you what it comes down to. The more, <coughs> excuse me, the more you diminish the holiness of God, the more you diminish the holiness of God, the easier it is to sin any kind of sinful lifestyle that you want to have. The more you exalt the holiness of God, the more your own sinfulness will show up. And so I understand. One of the things I look forward to, I was talking to someone on the way up to class, and they're asking about North Carolina this time of year and how it looked and how Thanksgiving was at North Carolina. I miss it. I don't miss it enough to leave here to go back there, but I miss it. 
I understand there is golden streets in heaven, and I look forward to that. But I can't wait to see the trees that God has. That's what I look for. I look forward to seeing, among other things, Jesus and biblical characters and loved ones. I look forward to the trees. But I'll tell you what I really, 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 really look forward to is once and for all losing the capacity to sin, to never have to wrestle with it, to never have to apologize to God or anybody else. And so I imperfectly keep the commandments of God, and you will as well. You know, the difference between us and a false teacher is that we absolutely believe the Savior in what he said about keeping his word. We absolutely believe in what he says, that we are kept for him. And it comes down to the difference between them and somebody that is truly saved. One more reference in First John, and we'll go back over. Chapter 5, verse 18. We know that no one who was born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, by the way, and the evil one does not touch him. What a wonderful reference that is that's somewhat similar to what Jude chapter 1 writes. Now that being said, let's go back. <clears throat> as my voice hopefully will last just a little bit longer. Let's go back to the book of Jude. For those who study this and will teach and preach through it, Jude does something that's very, very true. Well, all of it's true. He does something that's very similar to what Second Peter does. You may remember in your own reading through Second Peter, it is not until you get to chapter 2 of Second Peter that Peter starts dealing with the false teachers. Chapter 1, he talks about who we are in Christ. He talks about our responsibility in Christ. So in other words, before dealing with them, the Holy Spirit through Peter deals with us. Chapter 1 is written primarily to and about Christians. Chapter 2 of Second Peter is written about the false teachers. Jude will write about the false teachers, but look at what he does. He uses the exact same terms in verse 17. But you, beloved, and he does so also in verse 20 for those who mark your Bibles. But you, beloved, in verse 20, also in verse 17, but you, beloved. Now notice that in this case, he's already dealt with the false teachers. He's already given a brief account of this. If you're not careful, you can, by your own estimation, for those who are in Christ, you can, by your own estimation, look at a false teacher, and you know this guy's a clown. And you know when you hear him that either does not use the Bible, use the Bible, misuses the Bible, false doctrine, you know that it is. You can sit there and look, all right, all right, all right, well, yeah, it's not me, but you, beloved. Second time, but you, beloved. We have a responsibility to begin with. But you, beloved, verse 17, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last time there shall come mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. By the way, ungodly has a way of showing up in the book of, James, in the book of Jude. And that would come into those who have kept and those who have not kept. I don't know if you've marked this. Look at the four times that ungodly is used in verse 15. To execute judgment upon and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way. I'm starting to see a pattern here, aren't you? And all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against Jesus. And so there is a sense of ungodliness. There is a sense of not keeping the word. But there's also the reminder in verse 17, but you, beloved, ought to remember. Verse 20, but you, beloved, nothing to deal with them in that particular case, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with tongues as people call tongues. This has to do with your relationship to God. This has to do with your sins being confessed properly, you walking in obedience to God. Keep yourselves, verse 21, in the love of God, 
awaiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Now, part of the responsibility as we start to wind down, there seems to be three different categories in verses 22 and 23. Some people hold to two categories, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There seems to be a, a digression. There seems to be a more intensified. In other words, have mercy on some who are doubting. And that has to do with doubting the faith. It has to do with the influence of the false teachers. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. It's interesting in verse 23, the snatching is the same word that's used in 1 Thessalonians 4 about being caught up, snatching up into the air to meet the Lord, the rapture passage. And in some way, uh, have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. So some are kind of in a relative sense, not greatly affected on it. But all of these, there's a sense of action. All of these, there's a sense of snatching away. The third category is a warning for us. I mean, Paul says, reject a factious man after a second or third warning, I believe the reference is. There comes a point when there's nothing left to say. There comes a point when you have done everything that you can done, that you could have done. And so, you know, you pray through what to do on this. If you've got someone who has rejected God, has totally rejected God, wants to meet with you, or I would meet with them. But in the same way, after you've done it a few times, you better be real, real careful going in there because you can get as contaminated as well. And that's part of the warning. And we end it in a glorious reference, or at least a reference to glory. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a walk through, beloved. I know we didn't cover everything that we absolutely need to cover. Hopefully you'll get some use out of this. It's a great, great book. It is not going to go away, nor will use of this go away. If the Lord returns in... If he waits 10 to 20 years, and these are the last of the last days, you will have more false teachers and false teaching five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And if you are around, you will get a lot of use out of the book of June.